Hello, I'm Sharon Ross with the Capital City Arts Initiative based in Carson City, Nevada. CCAI is in its 18th year presenting visual arts exhibitions and cultural talks. We're delighted to present Hal Sterrett with our 72nd talk in the Nevada Neighbors series. Hal is an archeologist, a retired Western Nevada College professor and an alum of Tulane University. His career has taken him to research sites in Central and South America, to California, Louisiana, and Utah. Hal will give us a great archaeological tour on now on Peru's north coast. Nevada Humanities provided funding for this production. Thank you, Nevada Humanities. Additional Nevada Neighbors online talks are available at ccainv.org. Enjoy, and thank you, Hal. And thank you, Sharon. And thank you, Crystal. <laughs> so this is a, a talk on the uh, archaeology of the north coast of Peru, two, um, two projects that I was involved with in the early 2000s. And um, it, it's the, the kind of archaeology we did was, was started out as pre-Columbian. We looked at the ancient Moche civilization that had centered uh, along this coast. Um, and uh, later on, uh, much later on actually, the Spanish colonial period began and the Spaniards came and uh, established a, uh, um, a small township right on the same site. And so consequently we did sort of two different levels of archeology. span One was pre-Columbian Moche and the other was Spanish colonial. So um, th that's what I've decided to focus on in this talk. So here's a map of South America showing where Peru is. And um, this is a, a blow up of the, the map of Peru showing the coastal rivers. Um, there are 43 rivers that cascade from the uh, uh, Andes into the Pacific Ocean. Um, on the northern side and the eastern side of the mountains, you have the Amazon Basin, which is very moist and, and lots and lots of rainforest and, and, uh, and very moist climate. <clears throat> but on the narrow strip um, along the coast here, where you see all these little rivers, um, there it's a very dry area. It's, a, it's in fact a desert area. And because the, the mountains are so high that they cause a rain shadow, and so the moisture that you have in this area is all in the river valleys. And you find that uh, along the uh, western coast of Peru, you have lots and lots of places in these river valleys where early civilizations sprung up at different times. Some of them as far back as 2500 BCE. So way back 5,000, almost 5,000 years ago, we have people living in these areas and irrigating and, and uh, uh, starting ir uh, irrigation kinds of agriculture. The, the area I want to focus on is called the Chicama River here in the northern part of Peru. And on that uh, site, we have two um, archaeological projects. One was the, uh, at El Brujo, which was the, the site of the Moche civilization, and they lasted from about 100 to 800 AD, about 700 years, maybe a little more. They lived in these in these areas in these northern rivers and um, and built a very uh, elaborate civilization here, and then skipping way ahead to 1530s, um, Pizarro and the Spaniards came along and invaded this coast. And um, uh, at that point, the Moche were long gone, but the Inca had control over this area, and so they waged a war against the Incas and eventually conquered the Incan. Uh, empire and um, and that was the beginning of the colonial period. So here's a sort of a blow up of the map of the northern rivers uh, of the coastal area. You can see here's the desert area along the, the northern coast and the, the yellow areas is, is, is the area that's very, very dry, very, very um, uh, low rainfall, extremely low rainfall, very inches, barely an inch a year kind of uh, rainfall, and in the in the middle of it is the um, the Chicama River, and there's two sites here called Cow and Brujo. Now, um, the word that the South Americans use or the Andean peoples use for sacred places is Huaca, H-U-A-C-A is the way we spell it, 
And a waka is, it can be a natural formation. It's a, it's a place where they take um, uh, their um, spiritual or ritual kinds of practices too. And then there's artificial wakas. And these would be large constructions, in this case, pyramids made out of mud brick. And so we have two um, moche wakas here. One is called waka cow and one is called waka brujo. And this is a, a blow up of the map of the site itself. And it's a uh, geological terrace on the very edge of the, uh, um, of the coast. It's right on the ocean. And um, it was probably formed by um, the melting of the glaciers during the last ice age. And, and a lot of gravel came down, it was piled up here. Um, other people have ideas that maybe it's caused by earthquakes or uplift and other geologic forces. But at any rate, it's about uh, 10, 10 meters or about 30 feet above the surrounding countryside. And it's on this particular terrace that people uh, formed um, long-term uh, um, uh, burial practices. So this was kind of a, um, a place where people came to do ritual sort of religious practices, but also buried their dead. And, and so there was um, uh, a long history uh, of, of different peoples using this particular terrace. Um, and you see in, the, in these dark areas here, these are the wakas. Uh, these are uh, pyramids. These are the two moche pyramids in the northern part of the site. In the southern part of the site is another waka that's very old. It has a radiocarbon date of uh, 2700 BCE, which, you know, or 2500 around that time period. And this was probably one of the earliest um, constructions in, in Peru, in South America, perhaps, because we know that the earliest people um, to inhabit Peru uh, came down this coast. And this was, uh, um, wasn't Moche, it's pre-Moche, pre-everybody. It was one of the earliest uh, civilizations that built that one. But, but it just shows the long uh, period of use of this particular site. And eventually the Spanish came along and realized that it was a sacred place to the locals, to the indigenous people. And they built churches in a little town site here. So we're going to focus on this particular mound here called Huacacao Viejo. And it's right in the front of this or the, on the apron of this and it is where the Spanish township was built. So this is the site that we excavated, this part of the, the terrace. Well, can I ask it a looks question? like this is looking. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I've heard of BC, but what does BCE mean? What does that stand for? Um, it, it stands for before the common era. Oh. Um, and that is an archeological sort of reference that gives us an idea of, of how old something is. It, it used to be called BC, which is before Christ. Yeah. And uh, we changed that or it got changed um, to be a little, lot more inclusive rather than just a Christian uh, date time. Um, and so now it's before the common era and, and AD is Anno Domine in Latin, that means the year of our Lord. And so people still use AD to show that uh, it's in the time period from Christ forward, but it's also known as CE or the common era. Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. This is the terrace and it's, it's, it's pretty barren. Um, and you can see on the left over here is the uh, Pacific Ocean right along the beach here and on the right is um, is a uh, there's the river bottom and the river bottom uh, now belongs to a sugar plant and that makes uh, sugar for uh, for rum but on the edge on this very very short edge you see the um, there's little uh, cornfields and milpas we call them um, where people who are living here now um, I've sort of been given over to this land to, to grow um, vegetables and, and garden crops. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a mixed kind of use. But this is the terrace. I'm standing here on Waka Prieta looking north. And the two moche wakas, this is Brujo and this is Waka Cow, um, are, are in the distance. And this is uh, looking right along the coast. Um, this is one of the People have said this is a, a left-handed break and lots of surfers love this particular place to come surfing, although it's pretty remote. 
um, but they love the surf here. And you can see right along the terrace, there are uh, buildings that are crumbling out of the terrace and, and, and it's not clear who, who built them in the several thousand years that the terrace had been used. <clears throat> I, I would call it a necropolis, which is a, a place where, the, where they bury the dead. And many different civilizations over time came to use this place. Um, this is looking back at Waka, Waka Prieta, the earliest of them all, and they didn't use uh, mud brick, but they used stone construction, and they built this building out of stone. This is a trench that was put in the 1940s, and from the bottom of this trench, they got their radiocarbon date of 27 or 2500 BCE um, to show that this, this was probably one of the earliest religious structures in South America. Wow. And, um, recent archaeology of this site since I've been there <clears throat> I've sort of verified this it's pretty interesting stuff but that's not what we focused on <clears throat> we focused on the uh, the moche guacas to the to the north this is a uh, the modern village that lives right along the people live right along the coast <clears throat> here right below Waka Prieta on the beach these are little beach homes and little restaurants not and people are still fishing here. And um, this is the Pacific Coast fishery is one of the richest in the world. Um, and it's the source of our El Nino weather patterns. The deep cold water comes up and wells up with lots of, uh, lots of different uh, marine life. And it's been a rich fishery for thousands of years. I mean, this is probably the reason that this, uh, this area was occupied at all over the, over the centuries. And this is, this is a uh, sort of a uh, blow up of uh, the agricultural side, the, the, the river side of the uh, of the terrace, and I wanted to point out there's a little well down here, um, and the well is on the uh, on the on the surface of the sugarcane fields, and the well is only uh, it's about, about ten feet to the to the water table, um, and this becomes an interesting project problem later on when we find another well up on the terrace. And uh, the, in that well, they had to go down like 10 meters to find the water table. So the question in our minds is, why don't they just walk down off the terrace and, and have an easier time finding water? But that's, that's a problem we didn't solve. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is another view of the Shikama River Valley. You can see there's irrigation canals that the Sugar Cane uh, Corporation is using today, but they're ancient. They, they go way back in time to some of the earliest occupations. And here you have a mound uh, right alongside the canal where um, some earlier civilization, we never excavated that particular site, so we don't know who built it or when, but it's an ancient, uh, ancient site that goes along, I guess, with these, uh, these canals. How are the, are the corporate entities cognizant of these archaeological sites? Are they respectful? Um, I, I would like to, I think they are now because the government, the Peruvian government, has clamped down on, on a lot of the abuses that people have done to these sites. But there are so many sites in Peru. It's one of the richest archaeological uh, places in, in, I would say, the world. But it's certainly in, in, the, in the Americas. And so consequently, it's impossible for them to protect everything. And so the corporate um, entities will do what they need. Uh, I, I've walked out through the cane fields and found another waka out in the middle of the fields that that they had just uh, farmed around and left there. They didn't, you know, tear it down or anything. But it, it just begs to be yeah. investigated someday. But uh, no one really has the uh, the resources to look at everything that's a bit, that's in Peru. Oh. It's just a very very rich archaeological um, place. So. Looking at the Moche civilization, going back to the Waka Brujo complex, that's what the whole area up there on that terrace is referred to. And um, this is, like I said, from AD 100 or so, maybe a little earlier than that. We're not exactly sure, but by 800, the Moche civilization had uh, pretty much uh, faded out or been, been sort of usurped by another uh, group of people who came in and established dominance in this area. Um, and this happened over and over and over in Peru. So layers and layers and layers of civilization exist there, as I said, going back to 2500 BCE. So we're looking at just one slice. And this one slice is the Moche slice. And this is a, a, a view of Huacacao. 
La Cacao is a very interesting building uh, in that it, had, it was decorated with murals, very brightly colored murals, and I'll show you those in a second. And you can see there's a lot of potholes here because ever since the Spanish invasion in 1532, the, um, uh, the place has been just looted uh, over and over again because uh, of the riches that were found buried in the, the, uh, the tombs and the burial complexes. And so consequently, people have come and dug holes here. And it, it's against the law today. This is, a, this is an archeological uh, park, if you will, protected. Um, but uh, for several hundred years, people have come here to dig up pots and whatnot. And, and especially now you can find moche pots on the, mark, on the black market for two or 300 bucks. You can buy one yourself if you want. But they all came from, um, from burial sites like this. Uh, what the, the Waka Cow building looks like, it has uh, earlier structures in, it has about five different um, phases of construction. You can see here the corner of an earlier construction that was uncovered um, by um, erosion. Here's, a, here's an inner wall that was once used to be an outer wall and then eventually they decided to enlarge the pyramid so they started stacking up bricks and, and making the pyramid larger and larger. It's a stepped pyramid, that's, that's the construction style. And this is go, uh, comparing um, Waka Kau on the left and Waka Bruhu on the right, two different pyramids. You can see the millions and millions of bricks that went into the construction. Um, and you get an idea of how dense these, these buildings were amazing um and this is a again a view again looking south now from the top of waka brujo so again another idea of, of what this terrace looks like and uh, and what it looks like from the top now one of the things i mentioned is that these waka cow and especially um was decorated it was decorated with uh, with murals and these murals are a sort of a a mud, a mud um, stucco placed over the bricks and then uh, carved, um, modeled, if you will, and, and then painted. And uh, these must have been just extraordinary to see. Um, and it was done in every, every stage. The buildings were decorated this way. So there are, there are in, inner walls that have murals on them too that have been excavated. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. And I was brought down in, um, in 2002 as the project photographer. And I went through to, to record some of the murals. They had been uncovered in the 90s by the Peruvian government archeologists. And they realized that they had a problem with, the, with stabilizing these murals because um, they're very fragile. Um, and so they wanted somebody to come in and um, take uh, some uh, recordings of these murals. Here's a, a National Geographic um, uh, artist's rendering of what the, mur the, the Waka Cow looked like in its heyday. So you can see the, the murals on the step side of the pyramids. And then there's a large plaza in front, uh, a platform. Um, and this is where the, later on, the uh, Spaniards came along and built a, built a church and a township right on this particular part of the pyramid. So this is kind of looking at it today and you can see that, uh, actually not today, this is actually early 2000s, there were these canvas um, uh, tent awnings, if you will, that, that, were, that were all they had to cover the murals. And so they were very, very fragile. Later on, they came in with a, a much better kind of covering. But these things are very, very um, vulnerable to changes in the weather and wind and, and that sort of thing. So, so um, they needed them recorded. And so um, here is some a picture of some of the um, the murals that were uncovered covered them as I came to photograph them and they built a, um, a, a terrace kind of platform for me to sit up here and take pictures from um, and you can see that there's quite How quite complex you, murals yeah the paint that they used yeah well, has anybody found a chip of paint that they researched or figured out what kind of paint that was that's interesting. That last well, from what I understand, yeah, it's a vegetable base coloring, and I'm not sure what the base was. I mean, it's vegetable colors, yeah. veg you know, but but I'm not sure the base. The base is 
right now it's flaking off. So if you if you're not careful with it, it 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 will just peel because it's got a mud base behind it mm -hmm. holding it, and so um, it's pretty fragile. Interesting. Um, That's a long time to last. It, That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, truly, truly. So um, this is this is called Los Prisioneros or the, or the, the prisoners mural. Now. What we know the Moche did was practice human sacrifice. And so this might have been a, a staging area for their sacrificial rituals in this courtyard uh, platform in front of the pyramid. Wow. We're not exactly sure, but we're getting hints from other areas about how this, uh, this, this kind of ritual was practiced. And I'll show you that in a minute. But it was my job to uncover the murals and photograph them. And, um, and, and you can see that there's fragile kinds of coloration. Um, the the uh, line drawing above is actually from a moche pot. And I'll get to those in a bit too, but um, the moche uh, fine line pottery um, often depicted different different scenes of life in, in, in the moche civilization. And so here is one where it's marching the prisoners off to be uh, to be sacrificed. Wow. And then a, a tier up from the prisoners is the dancers. This is the danzantes and the dancers are, you know, holding hands in sort of a ritual kind of perhaps a dance. Um, that's our interpretation. Not exactly sure what this was, but uh, this was pretty interesting to see uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, figures in the Danzantes had a human uh, femur sticking out of the wall. Somebody put it into the wall. I don't know why, but it was pretty bizarre. Hmm. Um, and the preparation for the, for the murals, for the photography, we had to use these hand blowers to, uh, to blow the dust off in order to, to get a clear photograph. But um, as you can see, the paint's pretty faded in much of them. And so we had to go and use these squeeze, squeegees to just blow the, the dust off before we could photograph them. And uh, this is my wife, Jane, who was down there helping me. She was my assistant. And, uh, and this was another mural. This one is an interesting one. It, has, it shows individuals, pairs of individuals fighting with, with clubs. And we, we call it the, the combat uh, mural. And uh, we think it was ritual combat, um, but we're not sure about that. There's two schools of thought. Some people say it's just ritual. Other people say it just shows the moche conquering subjugated peoples. Um, but they have this, this whole mural uh, uh, sort of highlighting that. Um, and then the, the director, uh, the Peruvian director of the site came over and said, let's, let's just um, bring out the color. So he had a couple of guys come and spray water on the, on the mural, and you can see that it sure helps bring out the color, but um, it's controversial because by wetting things down, you're actually adding to their, their degradation. And yeah. uh, so we tried to get them to don't, no, no, we will, we'll get by with, we, yeah. we'll, we'll shoot the pictures dusty. Um, but he insisted and, and, um, and so he took, we, we, we have two kinds of photographs, the yeah. dusty ones and the wet ones. And, uh, and uh, later on, we had some conservators come down from uh, Smithsonian, and they tried to help us figure out ways to stabilize these murals and some other things that we found. And um, there just wasn't enough resources because it would take an amazing amount of, um, uh, of effort and money to, to really stabilize these. So, um, they are as they are. They they are going eventually disappear. I, I imagine. So the mo moche pots, their ceramics are really fascinating. They uh, they they carve. They they carve. They mold um, very ornate kinds of uh, things into their pots. So this is actually a pot with a with a, a moche warrior, and we get an idea of the way they dressed. And you can see he's holding this wooden club. And um, so somebody came along and did a model of this moche warrior, and you can see this at the site. But it, it was based on what we see in the in the pots and in the murals, the same kind of warrior kind of garb, the um, the the headgear and their weapons, etc. 
Now, there are other murals. The older murals are on building facades that had been buried and by expansion of the, of the waka. And so one of them is a pretty neat one that I was asked to photograph, and it's actually inside the, you had to go down into it to see this. Um, it's a mural that's about 60, 63, 65 feet long. Um, and I had to photograph it in, in pieces. And you can see this kind of composite that I put together of, of the mural. But it's, a, it's an abstract of um, maritime kinds of life forms. And I think we call this one Las Reyes because it's like uh, um, the stingrays um, that you find in the surf there. Um, and other forms that we just have no idea what the meaning is, but they're 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 ubiquitous. They're all over the place when you start looking at other murals and other pots. It's even found in some of the textiles. They wove these designs into their textiles, their um, cotton-based textiles, and it's pretty fascinating to see, without really understanding, the Moche and and the South American civilizations didn't have writing like the Maya did. So consequently, we don't have a direct link to understanding what they were thinking about, what their ideas were. We, don't, we can only conjecture. And so uh, we have lots of abstract things like this that um, are you know, fascinating, beautiful to see, colorful. But um, we really have a very limited idea of understanding what they are and what they meant to the people who built them. It's so impressive. Yeah. The linear yeah. lines and the yeah it's so nice with no yeah. modern technology <laughs> it's amazing it, it's interesting that that they didn't have writing because i mean this is really pictograms there it would seem like it wouldn't be much of a leap from this to actual writing but i'm not a linguist so i i well, don't it's a it's actually a big jump. It's a pretty big jump. If you look at Mayan hieroglyphic writing, it has a grammar and it has a link to phonetic um, structure of the language that was spoken. And the way we understand Mayan hieroglyphic writing is that uh, people, Mayan people today speak languages that are linked to those of the ancient Maya. And so we can use that as a window to understand. And eventually, I think we have about 80% of all the Mayan hieroglyphs, the thousands and thousands of hier Mayan hieroglyphs. We understand what they were saying. And that gives us a whole uh, uh, insight into the structure of Mayan society back in, in the classic period. We don't have that in Peru and we don't have that anywhere in South America. They do have something that's pretty tantalizing, but we can't really tell much from. And that is they use strings and knots. Um, they called kipus. And the kipus we think were accounting measures. We know they're mathematical. Um, and some linguists are saying, well, there's probably some grammatical structure to these knots, the color, the size of the knots, the placement of the knots, the way the knots are right-handed or left-handed and all of that has meaning. Um, but we still don't know what those meanings are because we have no link to the ancient language. There's yeah. not much left. The Spanish colonialism pretty much destroyed um, uh, uh, local languages, especially the language here. We, we don't know what the people's language was that built this pyramid. Mm. Interesting. Those are amazing, amazing images. I, yes, definitely. I, I was... I uh, literally blown away when I first saw them. I, I couldn't believe them. I bet. So this is what we call the decapitator gods. We know that they practice sacrifice. And here you've got this uh, kind of interesting figure holding up a head in one hand and a knife in the other. Uh, and it's a duel. There's a yellow version and a blue version. And um, so there's some sort of a duality um, built into their, their uh, philosophy somehow. Um, and but it's still tantalizing we can't quite understand exactly what they were up to or what they meant but we do know that this is about somebody's head getting cut off right and uh, interestingly i was looking at this mural close and i could see somebody had scratched sort of a graffiti image in oh. ancient times in, in <laughs> other words this this little scratch of this person whatever this person is doing here it might be a, a duplicate of what the mural actually shows yeah. was covered up in ancient times by the expansion of the building. So this, this, is a, this is ancient graffiti that someone had scratched into the wall before they, uh, before they covered it up. 
from the top of the courtyard in 2002, when we began this uh, project, um, we had a little grant from uh, National Geographic to sort of look at some murals that we had that were just tantalizingly uh, showing in the wall. And so uh, we started a project uh, with the Peruvians to un uncover those. And it was in this courtyard that some really great discoveries uh, occurred. Here's the beginnings of the uncovering of that wall. This is a, not a mall, but a flat wall, but with some of the same uh, designs we saw in the earlier mural. So um, they were copying and, and, and restating this particular um, motif um, at a later point in, a, in a, a, a later version. And as this happened, we, you know, eventually we uncovered the whole mural. And you can see here, this is a couple of years later. And um, it was covered, we had to cover it to protect it. So, so the Peruvians had enough money from National Geographic and National Science Foundation grants to go ahead and build a, a structure over it to protect it. Um, but also in the process, we noticed there were the openings of tombs in the courtyard. And so the, the, this, we call this court, it used to be El, uh, let's see, Rinconcito Gringo because the Gringos had brought the money to, to open these murals. But later on, when they found the tombs, they went in and they found the tomb of La Senora de Cal, who was a very wealthy, powerful woman who is buried here with a lot of gold and lots of really fancy stuff. Wow. And she was buried in this courtyard. So her, <laughs> she trumped. <laughs> Uh, the murals, uh, and this became the, the site of her tomb, and it was a very, very luxurious tomb. She was mummified in the process, and um, uh, it, it was a pretty, National Geographic did a whole article on her, um, but it came from this particular um, courtyard, and this is one of the uh, tombs of one of her, I don't know, her, her court, someone else was to, uh, buried here and you see some pots and there was a sacrificial victim was buried with this person too. And these, these are some of those around that particular courtyard. Uh, the Huaca del Sol and Huaca de la Luna that have also have murals that are exactly the same as the murals from Huaca Cao. So the question is, why would they have a duplicate pyramid in two different sites? Um, this is this is the Wakaluna pyramid. You can see there's the ritual combat scene. Is the um, the we call it the um, the cosmos scene. Um, here's the danzantes. So these are these are exactly like this the murals at Chica in the Chicama River. Um, so that's an interesting idea that they had these uh, duplicate. Um, kinds of designed pyramids. Um, the, the, these are in better shape because they were just uncovered when I photographed them. Um, so they were, they were pretty well preserved. You can see the colors are very nice. This is what I call the Cosmos mural because uh, it, 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 it reminded me of, of some Mesoamerican kinds of things where they put out um, sort of their idea of the universe and uh, you know constellations and stars and, and animals that they see in the sky and deities etc cetera, etc cetera. other people say it's more of a historic kind of mural um, showing the history of the moche but we really don't know exactly what it is i noticed there's a scorpion here and uh, i noticed also in up in uh, in, Gua in mexico the the mixtec people have scorpions in their um in their books and I thought the scorpion was, was kind of a, a interesting that maybe it was a constellation they recognized as we do too, as Scorpio. But um, that's just conjecture on my part. I thought it was kind of interesting. Lots of animals and snakes and things and people in this mural. And then we shifted our focus uh, in the following years. There was a, a well that was discovered and this well um, was a spiral staircase about 30 feet down. And we wonder what the heck was this about? Because like I said, you could just walk off the, the terrace and you wouldn't have to go down 30 feet, you just go down 10 feet and there's, there's water. 
but we think it was a special well. It was a, it was a ritual well, a ceremonial well. And the water at the base of this, because it was in a, a precinct of, of sacred places and sacred buildings, that the water itself was sacred and used in, in, in sacred rituals. And so that was, and it was very exclusive. You couldn't, you know, no one, not anyone could go down there. It had to be um, just the, the controlled by the elites. So we looked at it and wondered, what was the area around it um, like? What, what could we get clues from it, uh, doing test excavations around the well as to exactly what it was used for, when it was used, um, try to find out why they filled it up. They put a bunch of rubble, rubbish in there and filled it up uh, along with a sacrificial victim at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so we did these trenches <clears throat> and you can see among the trenches are all the potholes from looters for over the centuries. And the Peruvian government built a wall around the well so people wouldn't fall into it. So uh, that's what that structure is. That's modern. And here's again, you can see the, this is the water still down there. Um, a bus driver from a tourist bus when I was there came and he was thirsty. So he climbed down in there and got a drink. So it's, uh, it's still, you know, still in the water table. Um, but we, we went and found structure and all kinds of uh, uh, burials and other kinds of things that were done around the well that were linked to the well and uh, gave us sort of an idea about uh, what the purpose of the well was. Uh, and I found this picture in a museum in Lima of other wells in, in, in Peru. So this was a style of, of wells, of cer ceremonial wells used by other, other peoples, not just the moche. Wow, that's impressive. And this shows some of our archaeological project in, in, in action, and, and it shows uh, um, uh, some of the little walls of the buildings. Sometimes all you find is the foundation of the walls. Um, and then the artifacts that we'd find in the excavation, we'd put into a screen and we'd screen the dirt and looking for small things in a, a one-eighth inch screen so that we could, um, wouldn't lose little things. Little things turned out to be pretty in, important. Um, uh, later on. And, the, and because this is so dry, this is a desert, because it's so dry, um, it, it has amazing preservation. So uh, organic materials, things that were thrown away hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, are still preserved because there isn't the normal kinds of uh, uh, decomposition you'd find, say, in the jungle or moist a more moist climate. So we had amazing amounts of things that were preserved that wouldn't ordinarily show up in archeological digs. Wow. And here's a, a burial next to the mound that we found. And some of the artifacts, these are um, corn um, uh, cobs wrapped in reeds. Uh, we have no idea exactly why they were used this way or what they meant. They were in a cache, so they were probably an offering. Mm -hmm. And we find later on in our colonial excavations, people were still doing this. So um, this is a long-term practice uh, of, of these people on the coast. And again, here's the, the looters' excavation pits. There's thousands of them. And as you walk around, you have to be careful because there's human remains from those loot looted excavations on the surface. And you have to be careful where you walk because you find human bones and broken pots. And a lot of shrouds, these are, this is cloth um, that was used to bury, uh, to, to cover the uh, deceased in the burial. They were burial shrouds. And there are <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of yards of burial uh, material just sitting on the surface, you know, just slowly, very slowly, but rotting away. Um, here's a corn cob from, uh, I guess they put food in the in offerings with the burials, and here's a sacrificed llama mandible. Wow. Um, and this is what a, a reconstruction of what the burials um, looked like uh, from a museum display. You can see here's some some of the moche stirrup pots and some gourds and some gold um, leaf kind of, uh, uh, I guess it's flattened, pounded gold that's woven into the fabric of the, of the burial tunic. Wow. 
And uh, here's some of the shrouds you find. You have to just be careful not to step on it. I wanted to collect some of it so we could radiocarbon date it, but uh, it was so uh, mangled and, and we didn't know exactly where it came from to be able to, to, to show its provenience. So uh, basically it's just out there. <laughs> It's, and here's a close up. And, and, and because there's no rainfall, that's why nothing's rotted. That's right. It is one of the drier places. In the south end of this uh, strip of uh, land along the coast is uh, the Atacama Desert, which is purportedly the driest place on Earth. Um, this is north of that, but it's still very, very dry. So you have stuff like this as if it was thrown away yesterday. It just seems like anywhere by an ocean is damp, you know? So that seems so, I don't know. It just seems so weird that a desert is on the ocean. It's interesting. Wow. <laughs> Thank goodness it's dry because all this yeah, it's, it's great a, stuff. Yeah. It's unique in that re regard. Uh, it, I imagine you find dry places like this in the Middle East. And so there's a lot of uh, that, this kind of archaeology going on there, finding things that go way back because there's such little rainfall that uh, that they, their things are very well preserved. Um, but here it's 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 you it's just amazing. Um, here we have a desiccated human head. Um, you can see the cloth, the skin, hair, all that is preserved. And this is a this is a natural, in other words, this was just someone who was buried and it was naturally mummified. But then the Peruvians in many different levels of, of civilization in different, different uh, stages of civilization, um, they would mummify their uh, elites and bury them and wrap them, wrap them with textiles and then put them in a, um, in a tomb. And uh, we find lots and lots of these elite burials with mummies as well. Wow. This is, a, this is one of the most famous tombs. This is a recreation, a rec reconstruction of, of the Lord of Sipan. The Lord of Sipan is just a uh, hundred miles or so north of, of Chicama. And Sipan was a, a, a late Moche, early Lambayeque civilization uh, leader. And he had an amazing amount of gold and, um, and silver and precious metals and jade and whatnot and precious stones. Um, wove into his the fabric of his tunic and 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 set in there with cat as caches and amazing um, beadwork of uh, precious um, jades and other kinds of stones. This was one probably the richest tomb in the Americas. Um, it was again um, a moche uh, or a late moche tomb. And here's some of the the, the metallurgy we see. Um, the Peruvians, the Andean people, uh, were very early on discovered uh, metallurgy and how to make things out of um, copper and bronze and eventually gold and silver and then alloy those metals. And so they made beautiful things like here's a gold um, burial mask. And on the right is a tunic. And the tunic is little pieces, little squares of gold that are tied together with gold uh, wire. And you're, you're, if you were to wear this, your head would go in here and your shoulders would be here and this would be the back and the front. It would be a, a, a tunic that would wear over your body, solid gold, uh, pretty amazing stuff. I, I saw this, I couldn't believe it. Some other gold and silver alloy artifacts, uh, ear pendants and, and uh, other kinds of things. Here we have this, uh, the Moche warrior guy again showing up deities, supernatural entities, these cat figures show up all over the place. Um, here's a burial mask with gold and all kinds of, I don't even know what everything's in that. Um, and here's a head headdress, a moche headdress, and, a, and a, one of those nose um, uh, uh, contraption. I don't know what else to call it. We don't have a word for it because we don't use this sort of thing. And great big ear spools made out of uh, mixed gold, silver, and uh, different kinds of precious stones. So how, and bronze. Would, bronze was a big deal, too. So to do metallurgy, don't you need fire? And if you 
to oh yeah and to do fire don't you have something to burn so <laughs> what, what were, there yeah, was it's no not education too... there what so well, how were they making furnaces well, they were they were firing pottery and they were firing metals um and you know it's not it's not 20 miles or so is you'll get to the andes and you can go up into the mountains uh -huh. and bring lumber and other burnable materials there's um a lot of reeds that grow in the marshes uh -huh. in the river um, deltas and they used those reeds quite a bit uh, for construction. They built boats out of them, et cetera, et cetera. And so they could have used that for, for fuel as well. So bronze is a big deal. We have a bronze age in Europe, but uh, the bronze age um, in South America began probably 1250 BCE. Um, and that's way earlier. The Maya never got to, to using metals like the Andean people did. So um, as far as that technology, South America was far ahead of the rest of the Americas. Um, and we're doing amazing things almost right off the bat. Um, so the ceramics, the ceramics, this is a moche stirrup spout pot. It's a pretty interesting the way it's designed. You can hold it and pour it and it pours very smoothly. There's no Glug, 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 because the air comes in the other passage while the liquid's going out one side. And um, on top of that, they painted these with designs and motifs that really um, elucidated their lifestyle and the things, their, their life ways. And so we can get some of the things we see in these pots and actually find the artifacts uh, that correspond to these things. And we understand that these were parts of especially elite costumes and elite uh, tools, et cetera. Hey, Hal, is Most it, of the pottery you find. Is, the, is it fired, the um, pots, like the um, images? Is it glazed on, do you think, or is it painted on? Well, the, those are bichrome painted pots, the ones oh, that I just okay. showed you. Oh, um, later on, they did have glazes. Glazes, especially um, lead-based glazes and things like that were sort of a late development. You get the glossy kind of surface. Mm -hmm. But the early stuff was painted and, um, and probably um, uh, were pretty, you know, uh, burnished. A lot of burnished kinds of pottery and uh, slips were put on them and then painted. Um, and I think that's the major, major early stuff. Later on, the glazes got more sophisticated and the higher temperatures with the, there was a connection between high, high temperature glazes and, and, uh, and metallurgy. Um, and so when you start to get to some of the higher temperatures, then suddenly you can melt metals, melt you know, and, and blend metals. And so they were pretty early on, pretty, they, they early on per, figured out how to do that. But by and far and away, most of the pottery is broken. And, and this is the earthenware uh, or, 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 or plainware pottery that, um, that was used by, you know, most everybody. Um, it was only the elites that had the painted wares and the fat, fine wares. And so consequently, most of it's broken because yeah. when it's broken, you just throw it away. And so we find that in middens. We, we dig up these middens, these garbage piles. And sure enough, the, uh, the most of it, majority of it is this stuff. But the fine ware, as you can see, here's a burnished pot here with a rope a handle um, and some other things. These are, these are stylized with, with figures and deities and other beings and elite people. Um, and this is, this is the kind of stuff that would come mostly from tombs. So a looted tomb is about the only place you'll find a whole pot. And this is true of archaeology in general. Um, so when you find a really nice pot, say on, on eBay, <laughs> it came from somebody's tomb. It, it wasn't, or else it's a reconstruction, a, re, a, a copy. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is this is a, a spondylus shell over here. And spondylus shell is a specific kind of shell, reddish, that you find in a, a particular uh, uh, depth in the ocean 
off the coast of Ecuador. It's yeah. nowhere else. Yeah. And you have to go down between 10 and 18 feet to, to find it. Well, that became a real precious thing. And you find it in elite burials. And uh, it, it was traded up and down the coast, all the way up into Mesoamerica. We find spondylus shell stuff in the Maya re region as well. And we know it had to come from Ecuador. So what this does is give us a view of, of this coastal trade that was going on, that, that these civiliz civilizations weren't necessarily you know, distinctly separate and, and unaware of each other. Wow. These are some of the chicha jars, and chicha is a corn-based beer. And uh, so you would uh, put it in the ground in these jars to ferment with a cover on it uh, for a certain amount of time, and then uh, bring them out, out, and you could have your chicha, your, your ceremonial um, uh, alcoholic beverage. Um, and then here are some of the other moche pots. As you can see, they're very creative in terms of the forms that these pots took, these stirrup pots took, um, in terms of animals and nature and human kind of forms and, and uh, some, some supernatural kinds of characters, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the form of the Andean pot, the stirrup, called stirrup uh, pot. And there's the red on creamware um, fine line. And this was really fascinating because this is painted on a, on a uh, slip, a cream slip with red paint. And um, it's hard to tell in three dimensions what's going on unless you rotate the pot around and see what all the pictures are. Um, but a guy named Christopher Donnan, an archeologist, um, started collecting um, photographs, photographing hundreds of these and um, would piece them together and then he had an artist do fine line drawings of those photographs. And so we get these two dimensional um, rollout um, drawings of what was going on in the whole pot. So you could see it in one, in one view, what the whole thing was. And this is a very famous pot called the uh, sacrifice ceremony rollout pot. Down below, you can see there are people who are being sacrificed. You can see the blood coming out of the, of the incisions. And then up here, you have an individual who's um, being given a, a goblet of something. Um, some people say it's the blood of the sacrificial victims. That's um, one interpretation. But there's a lot of other things going on in these moche fine line pots. And the really interesting thing about this one is that there's a female here. Uh, let's see, this is the female figure here and three males. And you can see from the headdress and their costume, um, their particular um, role and their level in the moche elite. And we've actually found tombs of these individuals with these costumes. So it's really fascinating to see uh, this kind of um, agreement between the archeology, span the artifacts and the artwork. Hmm. Here's, a, here's the ceremonial pot showing three or four different sides of it. Um, and, uh, and then the sacrifices. We found in our excavation lots and lots of uh, human sacrifices. This was an individual that was buried under the corner of a building, I guess as a sacrificial uh, offering to the, um, the, the gods that be, I guess. Um, when the structure was con was uh, built, and um, we have Kathy Gaither, who's our physical archaeologist, uh, physical anthropologist, um, <clears throat> an expert on on uh, human physiology, and uh, she her job was to uh, excavate and take uh, or disinter, we call it, the burials, and and try to find out about who these people were and, and, and what we could from their skeletal remains. And here's that person's um, remains on our, our uh, lab table doing, and undergoing an analysis. And we found that he was probably killed by um, a spear uh, thrust between his ribs. And then there was a um, trauma to his skull. Um, but we know that he was a 23 year old, 20 to 23 year old individual by his 
teeth than by other means uh, of uh, dating a skeleton in his pelvis. Um, and we know uh, that he um, was probably in, his, in the prime of his life and he was in good condition otherwise, but he was killed and left at the, in that particular spot uh, under the building and the building was built over him. This is our, our lab and our bioarchaeology team uh, doing their analyses. This is the second sacrificial victim and you can see the, the skull fracture probably uh, was the death blow. And this is some of the, the, the Peruvian weaponry we, weaponry we find, the Andean weaponry. weaponry. These are stone um, uh, mace heads on, on wooden shafts or on a, a, a rope like a sling. And um, they had bronze spear points. Um, they had used these uh, tumies or knives, bronze knives and the ground stone mace heads. Um, these are um, their battle um, equipment. The other thing is fascinating about ancient Andean, uh, and this isn't just the moche, this is also you know, all the way up to the Inca period, the people were practicing brain surgery uh, and doing so by drilling holes into the skull. And for what reason? There's lots of possible uh, reasons. One was uh, because these were soldiers who had been wounded and uh, they did the surgery to relieve the pressure uh, of the, on the skull. Um, I, otherwise, we don't know <laughs> what they would do, but you can see that some people lasted or <laughs> survived and others didn't this particular surgery. Uh, for example, this person here, you can see the drill marks um, and there was no time after that for the person to heal. And so that they probably died soon after surgery. But this person here had surgery and you can see that the skull had grown back. Um, and so there were some successes in this process. Um, and that was fascinating because we're talking uh, ancient tools uh, and ancient techniques, medical techniques. And here you have these deformed skull, skulls. These are deformed on purpose. Um, and these are when uh, an, an elite, usually elites did this. And we find these in the Maya area too. Um, so this is not, this is a pretty common um, Mesoamerican and South American practice of binding infants' heads so that they grow into this way. And when they become adults, they're easily recognized as elites or royalty or whatever. And, um, so this was a pretty common practice. And then there's the, uh, I mentioned the reeds. Um, the reeds uh, were used in, in boat building. And this is, this is common all over the Americas, up here in Pyramid Lake, you can see that uh, people used um, boat, these kinds of reed boat designs um, uh, back in the days of Lake Lahontan, ancient Lake Lahontan out in, uh, in the middle of Nevada. We find the remains of these and people were building these kinds of boats way in, in historic times. Um, but the Peruvians used it way back in ancient times and uh, you can see it on the moche pots but here's um, on the coast at Huanchaco, you can see they're still building these boats. They still use these, this technology to build these boats and fishermen take them out to go, surf, to, to go fishing and then they surf the boats back in. Um, and it's quite an interesting spectacle. Lots of people line up to watch this happen on the beach. Um, and if you are a fisherman today, and you take one of these reed boats out to go fishing, then it's your job to bring it in and then carry it back up the beach and put it up so it will dry out. And if, you, if you're not man enough to carry this, then you, you don't get a boat. <laughs> so that's, the, that's the story. Um, and, uh, but it's a practice today and you can see then the, the effectiveness is in, in, out in the, um, uh, the museum in, in the Churchill County Museum in Fallon, you, there's a diorama of the ancient uh, uh, desert archaic people, um, their houses and stuff. And they have a reed boat, like not exactly like this, but a reed boat built like this um, that was used 
probably in, in ancient times as well. And so this is the end. This is our mascot, Chow, who was a Peruvian hairless dog. They, the, the Peruvian government um, supplies um, a little pooch like this on every archaeological site to show the, the heritage of these oh, animals or, or Andean heritage. And so from there, we say um, ciao. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> well, Hal, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. This was completely amazing. And we'd like to return to this and keep going with, with more of your stories and um, incredible knowledge. Um, thank you to CCAI's viewers and supporters and to Nevada Humanities. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a it's been it's been a blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. We'll okay. have you back for sure. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, Sharon. Okay.